Does anything still matter for these financial markets, or are we now on a smooth on-ramp into the end of the year, and we'll see everybody in January? Well, not quite. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And pockets of this market continue to show volatility. Uh, we talked about the uh, Japanese yen and the Bank of Japan yesterday. Boy, did that deliver. Uh, wild moves in the yen, and just as expected, the Bank of Japan gave us some uh, pushback on yen strength, now already fading in the opposite direction and uh, giving the kind of setups that we were looking for. And another such opportunity comes to us today, this time from the UK, where we're going to get a little bit of a gut check on last week's defiance from the Bank of England, because coming across uh, the calendar today, if you're in the U.S. and tomorrow morning, if you're on European time, uh, is going to be uh, the November set of U.K. CPI data. And although the makeup of it is probably not going to be terribly controversial, it does present an opportunity for markets to test their thinking against the Bank of England that just last week stood tall and told them, we are not cutting interest rates in any kind of hurry. So, so let's take a look at what is likely to happen here, why it matters, the response that it might have, and that it might generate in markets and what the trade setup here might look like. So first and foremost, a bit of context. This is 6B future, the British pound. Now, last week, the pointed muted rise after the FOMC seems especially notable. And that is, of course, because the U.S. dollar got crushed across almost all of its major counterparts. Almost all of the key currencies rose in a strong, spirited fashion against the greenback because the Fed came out and essentially owned the idea that the markets have been speculating about for some time, saying, yes, we are going to cut rates in 2024. Yes, we do think we're at peak interest rates. Not surprisingly, the, the dollar moved lower across the board, and including against the British pound. But very tepidly so. That, of course, was just hours before the Bank of England would have its say. And the expectation was that it, too, would follow the Fed's lead. European Central Bank, of course, met the very same day, and it also was seen going in the same direction. But the ECB has been less coy about its desire to start thinking about policy easing. The Bank of England, where inflation is still relatively high at over 4%, they've tried to sound a little bit more combative. And the expectations seem to be that perhaps with the economy stifled and inflation on the retreat, they might follow the Fed's lead. Well, that did not go down that way. A still chest out Bank of England came out, effectively told investors it had no idea what they were talking about, and asserted once again that they are intent on fighting inflation until it is good and dead. And the response, as we can see here, was emphatic. The British pound soared. Now, here is where things get interesting. The markets don't believe them. So we see here in the big dotted line, the setting for the policy curve on the day of the Bank of England meeting. So that subsumes whatever the markets readjusted in the wake of the policy announcement itself. That's the daily settling of the policy curve. 
The little dots are exactly a week ago. So two days before the Bank of England announcement. And we can see here the result. Here is the hawkish adjustment. So here was the curve when we were looking at what the Bank of England was going to do. They came out. They were more hawkish. They shifted the curve higher. The response, this jump in the British pound. But then, and seemingly without really any other key economic data, what do the markets do? The solid line is the current curve. Well, the markets shift down. So if this is step one here, this is step two. And so what we see here now is a situation where not only is the curve more dovish, but it's more dovish than it was before the Bank of England spoke last week. So the markets are really attempting to say here, not only do we not believe that there was a hawkish adjustment that made sense last week, we actually think the situation is even more dovish than we thought before you even told us anything. And so they are very pointedly calling the central bank's bluff. And so now we begin to ask, well, somebody here is wrong. Either the Bank of England is right and they are indeed going to have to keep rates higher because inflation will indeed prove stickier, or the market is right, and they're going to have to relent and cut rates. That, of course, sets up ample opportunity for volatility when you get the kind of news flow that can shape this forecast. And that's exactly the kind of news that we're going to get today, because November's CPI data is mere hours away. So. What is the expectation here? We're looking for a decline to 4.3%. That would be a climb down from the prior month's number. It would also mark the lowest inflation reading since October of 2021. So we're talking about a more than two-year low on CPI. Now, where this gets really interesting is in the components. And I've broken them down here so you can see even just anecdotally what seems to be the largest part here. And you can see right here, this is the latest bar, the biggest parts of this story. Food, recreation, restaurants and hotels, which we'll call hospitality. And looking at the whole breakdown, you can see it very clearly. Food is by far the biggest of the October number, which was, of course, something that um, should add up across all these categories to 46 percent, nearly 2 percent, so nearly half, is accounted for by factors that you might say are relatively straightforward to imagine disinflating. Let's consider first the food side of things, by far the biggest part of the story here at 1.2 percent. This was much the same issue with the Bank of Japan, who announced policy overnight. 
They didn't make a move on it. Their inflation is overwhelmingly driven by imported food costs. And they seemingly have figured out that this is, first, not really something that the central bank has any kind of agency over. Surely the central bank can't raise the cost of borrowing enough to discourage people from eating. And certainly it isn't easy to get off imported food. Much of the inflationary rise here is the global rise uh, in food prices in terms other than the pound. The pound has weakened over the reference period here, year on year. And that, of course, makes imported food more expensive. But besides having very little agency, the situation seems to be on the mend because global food costs seem to have peaked as early as March of last year, according to data from the UN, and have been doing nothing but falling ever since. I think we've managed a whole one month of, of, of gains in food prices since that peak, and otherwise, we've been going the other way. What we find is that there's about a seven-month lag between that decline and the transmission of it into global CPI. So if we take a global CPI measure and lag it seven months, all of a sudden this lines up, suggesting that here, yes, food inflation is still outsized, but it's going lower and will continue to go lower. This the, the orange tail that you see here leading the gray CPI line right here implies that this will continue to become a diminishing factor, not just for the UK, but in general. But certainly in the Bank of England calculus, this is something that's moving in a favorable direction and is likely to continue to move that way. The other two big components, recreation and this hospitality component at close to a percentage point each. And this is why we say over half of the 4.6% inflation here seems to be accounted for by temporary factors. Because if we take those three things out of the equation, we end up with CPI at a cumulative 1.56%. If we don't give ourselves the benefit of this inflation and the negative contribution from fuel, which is that sole red bar there, That's the contribution from housing, utilities, and fuels, of which the critical driver is, of course, fuel and the collapse, first and foremost, in natural gas, but also the decline in oil. If we don't give ourselves the benefit of that decline, and we factor that out as well, because, of course, energy is as much of a animal beyond the purview of the central bank's direct influence as food is, there, we're looking at inflation exactly at 2%, 2.1% if we're rounding generously. So we're looking at a situation then where if the situation with food comes down and these cyclical elements, recreation, restaurants, hotels, discretionary spending, is hemmed in, well, then the Bank of England doesn't have much of a leg to stand on to keep rates this high. And a pullback in the price for discretionary items, that writing seems to be on the wall as well. Because as we look at the UK economy, it looks anything but strong. Now, we've climbed out of contraction territory over the past two months, so we look at composite PMI, it is at 51.7. So 
that is growth in the logic of PMIs. What we're looking at here is 50 neutral, above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. And so we can see here, manufacturing is in contraction territory going back to the middle of last year, and recently has only been contracting faster. On the service sector, over the past two months or so, we can see there's been a little bit of a pop, and that's allowed the overall economy, overall economic activity, the composite index, to come out of negative territory. But at 51.7, growth is very slow. And that's as restrictive monetary policy continues to hold. So the path of least resistance from here is for growth to, at best, idle at weak levels. That is not the environment in which you would expect robust spending on recreation, hotels, and restaurants. So with that in mind, there seems to be good scope to envision that you are lining up for those factors to deflate as well. As a matter of fact, not only have the markets signaled that they're looking for more rate cuts, they've pulled inflation expectations down, as if to say, we're baking in more easing, which should, all else being equal, unshackle inflation expectations and nudge them higher. But we think the economic situation is anemic enough that actually inflation expectations go down even if the economy is weak, even if the response to that weakness is the expected loosening of monetary conditions. So the markets are saying the economy isn't strong enough to bid up even the five-year inflation expectation, even given easing. And by the way, it's not a negligible amount of easing. Even if we take a look at what we were looking at post the Bank of England, let's once again look at this line right here. Even if we take the most hawkish version of the recent outlook, here we are at about five and a quarter here. Within one year, at, at, at its more hawkish setting, the expectation was we'll get to somewhere here. So we get maybe one cut with some optionality for a second. So maybe we come down from something like four, uh, five and a quarter to four and three quarters, 4.75, something like this over the course of a year. Before the BOE, it looked like we were going to uh, come down to the tune of maybe 1%, maybe 75 basis points, something like this. Now, it's over 1% that the markets are baking in. A move from five and a quarter to 42 is a one percentage point decline with about five basis points hanging in the wind there as a slight possibility that you actually come down a little bit more, that you maybe get five cuts, not four, that a 25 basis point clip. So with that in mind, if the economy were strong enough and the expectation was, oh, well, the central bank is going to loosen borrowing costs and make economic activity cheaper to finance, even when it's a little bit you would think inflation expectations would rise because that kind of a move would encourage economic activity. But as it happens, the markets reacted otherwise. 
In fact, ever since August, they've been pulling inflation expectations down despite the dovish adjustment in policy bets. That, of course, sets up a direct collision between what the market is thinking and what the Bank of England is prepared to admit. And that's why this UK CPI report becomes so important. If we look at data from Citigroup, this is their economic surprise index, it reveals that UK economic data has increasingly deteriorated relative to expectations, basically since mid-year, and that most recently, over the past several weeks here, it's dropped back below zero, which means that at this point, UK economic data is tending toward underperforming relative to forecasts. So not just registering better, but by a lower margin, but actually missing forecasts actively. That this is occurring, that this deterioration in economic data has occurred, even as baseline expectations for UK growth next year and in 2025 have been revised sharply lower, really ought to tell this story. Because not only does this say that data is having a hard time beating expectations, it's saying that data is having a hard time beating falling expectations. So the bar is being lowered, and the data is so weak relative to forecasts, and this is key, whether it's weak in absolute terms is not the point here, it is so weak relative to even those forecasts, significantly downgraded ones, that there is more room to, to disappoint, all of which seems to suggest that this UK CPI report sets up the opportunity for the markets to get what they want to hear. They are pointedly telling the Bank of England, we're not buying it. You are not nearly as hawkish as you are signaling to us, or at least maybe you've convinced yourself but we're convinced you're going to have to throw in the towel on this thing faster than you thought, or at least faster than you think. And so if you get a CPI number that follows this dynamic here and misses relative to forecasts and comes in not at 4.3, but let's say 4.2 or 4.1, and its internals continue to look something like this, whereby you can strip out food, you can strip out the cyclical bits that are doing most of the heavy lifting and see in there a disinflation that is very much afoot and an economy that very much is showing signs of wear and tear, the market will be emboldened in saying, no, Bank of England, you're going to have to make this move. And this disconnect will close, or at least is going to get some of the way toward closing. And the market, in saying that the current outlook is even more dovish than the Bank of England looked like before they pushed back on dovishness, that's going to look even more credible and make more sense. That, of course, bodes ill for the British pound, which has been hanging out in digestion mode here ever since this volatility last week, but may now have room to turn back down. So just as we had one-off volatility bursting out of the yen overnight, it, it may be the pound's turn now. And that, of course, presents an opportunity. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Chris Vecchio and Dylan Radigan, where we look at what happened on Wall Street on a given day and try to figure out what it means and what happens next.
I'm back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Tom and Tony for First Call on Sundays, writing for the news and insights section of tastylive.com, and opining on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilias Pivak. Thanks very much for joining. Happy trading. See you tomorrow.